Hi, welcome to Chad Silversmithing. Before we get started, I wanted to thank you for watching the channel. And uh, if you would, it helps me a great deal if you'd hit the like button before you leave the video. Uh, and if you enjoy the content that you find here, I'd love it if you would subscribe. I'm also a big fan of comments and suggestions, things like that. So uh, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for me if you would. Uh, with that being said, um, today's project is going to be um, how to make a simple basket prong setting. And uh, I'm going to use a little bit of um, moldavite. Uh, I have a little faceted moldavite I'm going to use for the stone. And we'll start uh, with building the prong setting. And then we'll make a little uh, ring out of it too. So you get kind of a two-in-one bonus. Uh, so let's get started. So when I first started doing this, um, I always wanted to set stones that were not just cabochons, that were these faceted kind of stones. And I pretty quickly figured out how to do bezel settings, but prong settings uh, eluded me for a long time. Um, I tried a number of ways without doing any research, and most of them failed pretty miserably. And then I started looking at books, and there's a whole bunch of different ways to do them. Um, the way that I usually do them is kind of a simple uh, way that isn't too difficult, but it does require a little bit of practice and pick soldering. So. Um, you might be able to do it with some paste solders and some other things like that. Um, that's not the way I normally do things, so I, I can't really speak to that, but I, I could visualize doing it that way. Um, but this way uh, works pretty well for me, and I hope you can uh, make it work for you as well. So um, the only things we'll need is our, I got this uh, little moldavite, and I usually, for small stones, I use 18 gauge round wire for the, uh, to make the basket setting out of. And the ring, I'm going to use some 12 gauge square wire, I think, which I'll shape into a band to make it kind of a, uh, sort of like a little solitaire ring, kind of. Uh, looks like an engagement ring. So, um, but we'll start with the, the prong setting. And um, to do this, we might need to talk about some of the parts of the stone here. With a faceted stone, uh, the top set of facets. Uh, all of those and the table facet on top, which is the big flat facet, um, that's all called the crown of the stone, that part of the stone, the upper part. Um, here you can see uh, this part that divides the crown up here from the bottom part, which usually comes to a point, is the pavilion. And the side part here, where the widest part of the stone, is called the girdle. Okay, so. Uh, just so that we're all on the same page when I'm talking about these things when I'm making the setting here, uh, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, the first step I'm going to do, and it's always easiest to do this with the stone sitting on its top side, or the crown of it, is I'm going to make two jump rings. One is going to be just slightly smaller than the diameter of the stone, so if I was to set the stone on top of it, you wouldn't be able to see um, the ring itself. Uh, of course, unless this one's transparent or translucent, which it is, but it hides the complete ring. The next one will be almost uh, the size that will fit into the other ring, but not quite, is usually about the size that I make them. Varying those sizes can, can uh, be done and it doesn't matter that much. Uh, what it has to do with is when the uh, prong setting is finally done, how straight up and down the prongs are, or whether they uh, go out like this more. So the smaller the bottom ring is, the more tilted out they're going to be the bigger the bottom ring is, the more straight up and down it is. So I like to have them tilt out a little bit when I'm making my prong settings. So to start with, I got some 18 gauge. I cut about a six or seven inch piece here. I'm going to file the end flat. And then I usually make, uh, when I'm making rings to a very specific size, I, I set it over the stone here and I start making a manual ring like this. If you need to use, uh, like a, a jump ring uh, mandrel or those bail making pliers are pretty handy uh, for doing rings like this. That works too, but I like to do it freehand like this because that way I can set it above the stone like this and see how close I am to the actual size. Let's see, to me that's, uh, that's still just a little too big, so I'm going to make it just a little bit smaller like that. Take a look at it. Sorry, my head gets in the way when I have to lean forward to see how close I am, but 
Uh, hopefully you can see that. Still working on a better camera and viewing angle, so hopefully um, I'll find some solutions to that soon. Oopsie. Okay, so I cut that off. Just going to line up the jump ring. Make sure it's relatively round here. Set it right on top of there. Here. Keeps flipping over on me. Okay. Now I see it conceals the ring, but just barely. So the second one I'm going to make about the size so that it almost fits in there. So you can kind of see the difference in size there. That one almost fits in there. That's a pretty good size. So now I'm just going to solder these closed. I know they're not perfectly round. I'll probably round them out a little better before I do the next step. <clears throat> but I'm going to cut myself some pretty small pieces of solder for this one. We don't want to have a lot of clumpy big chunks of solder since we're doing a little delicate prong setting. So I'm going to cut some real small kind of squares here. I always cut extras because I end up chasing them around the pad with my pick sometimes. Or they melt and ball up and roll off. It never hurts to have a few extras. But you can kind of see how small those are right there, if you can see that. Alright, I'm using my backup torch because I ran out of gas in my other tank and I didn't feel like running over to the place today. So once I have those two rings soldered, I'm going to make a mark right on the solder joint, there, and then 180 degrees from it across the ring. So I've got a, a mark there and a mark there. So I'm marking where I'm going to file a notch into these rings. The reason I do it on the solder joint is we're going to be soldering something vertically, like this, uh, with relationship to the ring and when we go to solder those on um, if we do it right on the solder joint uh, there's already some solder in place there and it'll just flow and stick so it'll give us kind of a free solder joint and I'll explain that again when we get to that but let, I'm going to let the sharpie dry a little bit and then I'm going to file a notch <clears throat> and you could probably do this in a lot of different ways but I'm just going to use the edge of this half round uh, needle file and I'm going to file a notch on the outside edge right where the solder joint is. And it doesn't have to even go halfway through, just enough to where a piece of wire going alongside it will kind of catch in there. And then I'm going to go straight across from it where I made that other mark. This is where I usually screw it up, not getting it straight across from the other one. And you're going to do that on both of the rings. If there's a little bump of solder sometimes on the outside, if you file it flat first, it makes it easier to get a notch right into the center of it. Alright, so the rest of this piece of 18 gauge wire, I'm going to cut myself, I'm going to cut more than I need and then I'll cut it down a little bit when it comes time for that. I think probably a couple inches for the first one. And what we're going to do is we're going to fashion the 
we're going to make a four prong basket setting and we're going to fashion two v-shaped things out of 18 gauge wire as well it doesn't have to be perfectly in the center or anything I'm just going to kind of eyeball it and make kind of a sharp v-shape here see it's not in the center so it really doesn't matter um, but for me it gets hard to hold on to these little rings like that especially when you're trying to fit them into something hmm. and I can see that I didn't file this one near in the right spot so I'm going to do a little more filing on this um, what I was saying is for me to hold on to something this small is sometimes hard so I'll oftentimes use the tweezers while I feed it down and I'm, I'm running this down those notches that I just that I just created in order to get an idea about how far down the V that this will fit kind of nicely. See like that. Hopefully you can see that. And then use that marker if I can find what I did. on the inside because I'm going to make a little notch on the inside of these two and I want to get them as close to straight across from each other as possible so now where these two marks are here I'll make a notch on the inside of this V again it doesn't have to be super deep fits down in there now. Okay, that sits in there reasonably good. Okay. This is one of the few times where I use a third hand. So, when I do these, I'm putting them right in the end of the third hand at the bottom of that uh, V that I created. And I want to tip it just a little bit away from me so I can see what I'm doing. But if you tip it too far, when things get hot, then it can slump. So you don't want too much of a slope on there. And the really vulnerable part when you're soldering these guys are these wires up top. Um, if you get those too hot, they'll start to melt and, and, and roll under. And so if you start to see anything doing, uh, doing, kind of going in that direction, I would stop, reevaluate what's going on, and change my strategy. Okay. Now, you remember I said the reason I uh, filed right on the solder joint earlier was so we get a free solder? That's where this comes in here. Because uh, one of these places where I made the notch already has some solder in place from when I soldered the ring closed. So all I have to do is flux it and heat it up to the point where it flows and it'll stick to one side. The other side, however, I'm going to have to pick up a piece of solder and pick on there. So um, depending upon how good of a solder I am on any given day, this can be a challenging um, thing, especially if you're shaky. Because um, I don't want to bump it too much and I want to just get in there right at the moment when the, solder uh, when the piece of wire is hot enough for the solder to flow so it just jumps right in there. Okay. So I have all those pieces of solder down there, so let's see if I, if I can do it today or whether it's one of those days. Alright, the real key I have found, the real key to, to not melting these is to heat, kind of, see how I'm holding the torch sideways like this? And pushing the heat upwards from the bottom. All this thing soaks up a lot of heat. Up here, these are really vulnerable. If you hit, put the flame right on those wires, it's going to start to melt them almost immediately. So I'm pushing the heat upwards from the bottom. And I'm watching 
When I see a shininess form on one or side or the other here, that means that solder joint fluid. Okay, so we got our free solder joint, I think. Yeah, it was on this side here, so now I need to come in here. Oops, I lost the little ball of solder that was on here. Pick up another one. And again, pushing the heat upwards. Now, cool this guy off. Okay, and this is what he looks like at this stage. Um, if you need to, you might be able to. Sometimes I don't have the the ring perfectly perpendicular to the to the wires, so if you need to, make some adjustments right now. So next, I usually pull these in a little bit, and then just like uh, with the other ring, it's hard. It's easier for me to hold if. To position it down here if I slide it down with the tweezers like this. Oops. Sometimes you need to go a little wider, sometimes you need to go a little narrower. This one looks like I need to go a little wider. I'm going to try and get it as close as I can to this other ring. So that's pretty close. If you get it too close, then you end up, uh, sometimes if you get things too hot, the two rings will jump together inside of me. <laughs> I've had that happen a few times on me, but that gives me an idea about where to put the notches for the upper ring. So I'm going to... Alright. You want to try pretty hard to get these guys parallel with each other, otherwise your um, setting is going to look a little wonky. All of the other silversmiths will ridicule you for your wonky setting. Nobody wants that. I don't know if you could hear that on the audio, if the audio is good enough, and I suppose it goes click, click when I did that which says to me that it's pretty good. And before you solder this one, you want to make sure you know it's sitting parallel with the other ring like this. Uh, if you want to, if it's a little bit loose, you can push these inwards just a little bit like that if you need to in order to make it stay in there more securely. But yeah, before you solder it, make sure you get everything lined up the way you want it to. We're going to do the same thing we just did. Now those of you who are using multiple types of solder. I'm just using hard solder for all of these, but if you're using it with the idea that you're trying not to remelt your previous solder joints by gradually using lower temperature solders, um, you might have used hard solder for the first uh, couple of solder joints and then move to medium or whatever you use next, and then for the last couple do easy if you want. But um, I just use hard solder for all of these and it usually seems to work out just fine. Once, once again, we get a, we should get a freebie solder here. And I want to remind you to push the heat upwards. Notice I'm never really, I don't know if you can see from that angle, but I'm never really even focusing on those wires up above. I'm pushing it upwards because they get hot just by being up there. So I got the one freebie. Get this solder here. Again, push the heat upwards. Okay. So next thing I usually do is I kind of eyeball the center between these two wires like this. Use that as a guide to mark a kind of center of the lower ring as well. I'm marking the places where I'm going to file a little notch on this one now on the outside. I 
usually file a notch in the top one. And then use that as a guide to, to kind of guide the file to do the second notch. So you get them one right above the other one. So it's good to know also that this excess up here, we're only going to need about that much of the prong that's above here. All the rest of this is going to be cut off. Alright, so I got some notches made on those. I'm going to cut a second piece of this 18 gauge wire uh, for the second V, I should say. Cut it about a couple inches long, the other one. And I have found the wire has a natural curve. This works best. If you do it against that curve so it gets kind of a, a curving outward V like this, for some reason it seems to line up best with these when I slide it on here like this. It gets closest to touching the ring on the bottom. Sometimes, sometimes you have trouble where it doesn't quite reach the bottom ring here. In this case it's not quite touching there. So I'll have to modify the curve just slightly to make sure it goes all the way in there. And it's probably just because I misaligned the bottom ring just a little bit. Okay, once you get it to where everything's touching, I'm not going to file notches. I'm not going to file four notches on the inside of this V, I'm going to file just notches for the top ring here because it's too hard to get them all in exactly the right spots for them to line up perfect. And as long as you get it to stay in place, that's all that really matters. So I'm going to be filing two notches. Straight across from each other for the top ring. Okay, so you can see this now. So I got contact here, 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 and here. And what I need to do, I, you don't get any free solder joints after you do those first two. So these ones are all going to have to be done manually. And so, just like before, I'm going to position this. Tilt it a little bit. And then we'll do four pick solderings here. Same same deal, we're pushing the heat from below. It doesn't really matter which one you do first, I usually do one on each side, make sure they're kind of staying together. Okie dokie. Before I go any further, I want to make sure that all of these solder joints actually got soldered. I know it looks kind of rough at this stage. But, all we have to do next is to snip off these bottom, snip off the bottom right where that meets the ring there. And then, usually straighten these back out a little bit. Cut these a little bit shorter, but make sure to leave enough for the stone. When we go to set the stone, we'll be doing the final trimming and filing of these. But basically, now we've got, you can see this, we've got four prongs going upwards, two rings, one above the other like that. And then um, what I'll do is I'll file the bottom of this. 
and we'll go ahead and make a band for it and make it kind of a solitaire. Uh, I think you'll like the way it comes out. So, so let's make a size 8 just for something different. So I'm going to take a piece of a strip of paper here. I'm going to wrap it right around the 8. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to mark it pretty close to where they meet. Maybe just a tiny bit extra, not as much as I usually do. This length here, from here to here, is the overall length of the ring. Now this is going to become part of the length of the ring because it's going to be sitting on top of the finger like that. So we have to deduct the width of this from here. So I'm going to make a little mark. It's right about there. And that's about how far I need to cut my piece here. Now, I'm going to use some 12 gauge square wire, which is relatively thick square wire. Let's cut this off. Cut this off about that length there. to give it kind of a wider top at the ends of the band. I'm going to pound this on the ends and flare them out a little bit using a little chasing hammer and just a steel surface. Let's see how close we are to our original size now. Sometimes I'll stretch it a little bit. So, see how that made it a little bit longer, so I'm going to trim off just a bit of that. Get us closer. Now I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to file these a little smoother. And so I'm going to anneal the whole thing, which is to soften the metal back up. cool for a minute. Okay, now I'm going to clean it up a bit with the file. So, something I typically do just to give it a little pizzazz is I'll do a 45-ish degree angle on the corners here. Okay, so I've got sort of a coffin shape on, on the end of each of these. Now let's just going to wrap it around the ring handle here. Use the plastic headed hammer or a rawhide mallet if you prefer. Right now I'm just doing some fine tuning as far as getting these ends kind of coming together correctly. So what we really need to do is we need to get this to sit right in between those. The other thing we'll have to do is right now the uh, the ends of these wires are filed kind of 90 degrees that way from the way they originally were. Now they're curved and I want them to go straight up and down. So I'm going to have to, and I'll demonstrate with the little file, but I'm going to use the big file, I think, if I can get it in there. I need to make these ends kind of that direction instead of this direction. So we're going to file that upwards like that. So if you don't do that, and when you go to set this in here, it's going to keep trying to pop out of there. Another thing you can do if you have trouble getting it to sit in here, if you need to, right here on these side of this ring, if you flatten it out a little bit with a file or with a Dremel, sometimes that'll sit in there a little bit better. I like it to be squeezing in there pretty tight and not trying to escape. So, so once you have it staying in there, look at it from this direction like this. Make sure it's sitting upright. Get it from this direction. See if it looks cockeyed from any, any particular angle. If not, 
can do is I usually um, I use a second pair of tweezers to take my third hand spread it open just a little bit because what I want so I want a situation here where neither the prong setting nor the band can fall down. This allows me to elevate it and be able to heat it from all different directions. Um, but the trick to soldering these these little prong settings in without remelting them is most of the mass of this ring is going to be down here in the bottom. So I'm really going to, again, like I was doing when I was making the prong setting, I'm going to heat mostly on the bottom here and push the heat upwards a little bit. And then I'll pick a little bit of solder there. I'll probably turn the whole thing around this way and then pick from the other side again for the other one. Make sure I want to use a generous piece of solder on each of these this time. So I always cut a few extras because inevitably one rolls off the pad or something. Okay, let's see what we can do here. like we got good solder joints. So now, um, before we set the stone and polish and everything, I'm going to go ahead and pickle this for a while. I'll come back and finish that. So I did a little cleaning up with the Dremel to get things uh, all nice and shiny and ready to go. And I thought we should set the stone next. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of specialized tools for doing this, but you can get by with pretty much just a pair of needle nose pliers and a file for something as, uh, as big as this one. This is a pretty big stone. Um, so what I usually do, I'll set that in there. And then I'm going to look and see about how high that girdle of the stone meets on these uh, on these prongs that are going to stick up above. And I can kind of estimate where I want to thin them out just a little bit because I'm going to thin the inside out just a tiny bit right where the girdle touches the inside of those prongs. So I just use my little needle file. I'm just going to use the rounded side here to kind of thin it out right about there. You don't want to get too crazy about it. I wouldn't go more than you know, a third of the way through. I just want to give it a tendency to bend right there instead of elsewhere. Got a little notch on each inside edge there. That's on here. Okay. Typically, I'm going to look at it from the side like this, make sure it's sitting flat. And I usually, the reason I leave quite this much prong up there is so I can grab it with the needle nose pliers. And I'm going to go to one side like that, and then go straight across from it, do another side. It might not stop moving on the first go around here totally. to kind of holding it in place sideways. Now, let's go to the other two direction here. I'm going to push a side that's a little bit higher down first to push that side down. Like that. And then I'm going to push this in all the way against the stone. It's sitting a little ways away from there. I'm going to do that. you start to get to that stage, it's going to quit moving much on you. And then I'm going to clip off part of these here. I'm not going to trim them all the way down to where they're going to be finally. But I want at least enough gone to where I can push them down as far as they'll go. Okay, and I can use the little flat side of the needle nose pliers here to do that. The amount of pressure you put on these is going to be dependent upon how hard of a stone you have. Now, uh, Moldavite is 
basically glass that was formed when a meteorite or a, an asteroid hit the Earth and immediately fused some of the uh, silica in the in the ground into glass and so it has a kind of a, a fun celestial origin okay so typically once I have it uh, pushed down as tight as I can get it to go then um, hold it up closer here so you can see but these uh, these girdle facets they're called girdle facets that are right above the girdle they're the slope that go up to the table facet which is the top flat part so I usually try to cut these uh, flat about midway down the girdle facets so pretty short like that this is where you don't want to get too aggressive because if you cut too much off you can't really uh, do anything except for do a new setting unless you want to try and put a little extra uh, 18 gauge wire on the, on the tip of that prong which is pretty hard to do Okay, I'm going to try and get them to be relatively you know, similar in length. The last thing I do then before I polish is I'm going to use the needle file. I'm going to kind of put my finger, fingernail like that to kind of protect the stone. Some stones, if you're using a cubic zirconia or something, you don't have to worry too much about scratching the stone. But moldavite being volcanic, or not volcanic, but uh, tectite glass is relatively scratchable. Okay, so mostly what I've been doing here is making them as symmetrical as possible, and I'm, I'm kind of uh, draw this so you can see it's kind of hard to see when you're doing something that small. But um, if you got your stone like this, here's the girdle right across the middle. Your prongs are basically coming like that direction. Okay, so you're bending them over like this, cutting them off there, kind of. Like that. And then what I was just doing with the file, I was taking this part, basically kind of rounding it. So it goes in like there and won't catch on things. So all of that's filed away. So it ends up kind of curving in there nicely so it doesn't get caught by things so much. So basically all I need to do now is go polish this and I'll show you the final result. Okay, finished polishing. Can I see the ring? I think it came out pretty nice. Um, just about any nice uh, round faceted gemstone looks pretty good in this sort of just classic simple setting you know so I'll take a better picture of it and put it at the end of the video uh, a couple of things to note um, this is just one way of making uh, a prong setting there's numerous different ways I would recommend uh, getting uh, one of the various jewelry instruction manuals um, that show how to make some different kinds of settings and look at the way they do it. It's fun to see how different people do things um, and to take from each one the things that you think are most valuable to you. Okay, well thanks for watching this video. I appreciate it if you hit the like button before you leave and uh, if you enjoyed the content make sure to subscribe to my channel and maybe ring the bell uh, so you get uh, notifications when I upload a video. Um, thanks again for watching and happy silversmithing.